Welcome back to another episode of The Loco Fit Show, where we redefine what healthy means to you. I'm your host, Lauren Conlin, and this week I'm joined by Rick, our team mental health counselor, and we're going to talk all about codependency. Mm-hmm. And this is something that I know comes up in your practice all the time with clients. And sometimes people are probably coming in being like, hey, I think I have this. Mm -hmm. Um, Or I think I exhibit some of maybe these traits. But would you say that there's a lot of people who maybe don't know that they're dealing with this? And then they come in and it's like really revealed over time with the the things that you guys are talking through. Yeah, I think what brings people in is sometimes like exhaustion. Like they have a relationship in their life, be it with their mother, their father, their brother, sister, or significant other, that they're they're just finally at this space where they're kind of exhausted. They don't know how to deal with it. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of tension. Um, and so, you know, obviously as you start kind of diving into their story and getting to know them and learning about what's bringing them into therapy, sometimes these things start to kind of uncover themselves. Um, and there's a book I'll reference the book, uh, later on that once I start to recognize that they might have some codependent tendencies, I'll recommend the book is actually called, um, codependent no more Hmm. by Melody Beattie. Okay. Um, it's an excellent, excellent resource for it. There's actually two books. There's one that's a book and then there's a workbook. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. I recommend people start with the book so that they get an understanding and make sure that this is something that they struggle with. Um, and then you can get the workbook and kind of work through it because it helps you understand like boundaries and things like that. We're going to get into a lot of that, but yeah, I mean, sometimes people come in and they're like, I'm dealing with this. They don't know what it is or why. And then it's kind of like here, I think you have some tendencies with this. They start to understand it a little bit more. And then, you know, it's kind of like a a little bit of a light coming on and, and they're like, Oh, okay. And so it's kind of the way that they exist within the relationship. And traditionally, would you say this affects women or men more or is it equal codependency is something that more women tend to struggle with um for several reasons number one i think more women just generally will attend therapy period so they'll be more exposed to it but um if you look at traditional masculine versus feminine roles women are traditionally more caregivers um, more motherly more maternal Um, and so by that nature the role of codependency is that it literally is like kind of an exaggerated role of the caregiver where you start to sacrifice your own needs for the betterment of the family or these people. And so it just seems to be more relevant and prevalent in, you know, with women. It doesn't mean that men don't have it. It just means that, you know, it's more commonly seen for women. Yeah, that makes sense, especially with that traditional just kind of caregiver role, which even if you are a very, you know, like have have masculine tendencies in terms mm-hmm. of like being a female, like, you know, very like high charged, very high energy, like working in a certain capacity, like all of like, that doesn't mean that you're not doing those things. Mm-hmm. But oftentimes we just, I feel like can take on the burden of a lot of people, whether we should or shouldn't, which is where the boundary part comes in pretty right. nicely. Exactly. Um, and that's also just kind of like the, con- not, I don't want to say social conditioning, you know, but like, mm-hmm. I think it is partly, partly that too, right? Like that's what, you know, women do and there's there's nothing wrong with that Mm -hmm. right like when it's in a healthy way um but like anything if it becomes unhealthy um like you said it's more of like that exaggerated role right then it can it can really be harmful to everybody involved because it's not Mm -hmm. the other person in that relationship like yes they're getting a lot out of like the person Mm -hmm. um but who's like giving everything but it's like that's not healthy for them either long term right. like that's not good for they don't maybe realize it at the time but like mm-hmm. that's not good for for them as an individual either right no exactly and so when you look at the way like even the way we raise children like look at i mean traditionally it'll be interesting to see how codependency evolves with the changes in society especially some of the changes that we're seeing now with you know what are what gender is and what identification means um and that's a whole nother topic for a whole nother time. But when you look at, you know, you go back to the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, girls were given dolls to play with, you know, and they were told like, here's your, your kitchen set kind of stuff. And so, you know, and boys were given GI Joes and trucks and they were taught to go be rough and tumble. And girls were like, you know, this is your baby. You're supposed to take care of your baby and change your baby's clothes and nurture. And so it <laughs> makes sense why women, you know, would have more of not more of an issue but be placed in the spot to be a caregiver because that's what they were nurtured and groomed to do Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, like I said, it'll be interesting to see in 20 years from now, children who are being born in today's society and what those roles will be, mm-hmm. um, you know, because they've even talked about how there's like a, the children in today's society are, you know, in their 20s right now. They're seeing like a decrease in like testosterone levels in men and all kinds oh. of stuff. And so it's like, it's going to be a completely different world 20 years from now. I don't, I don't know what it'll look like, but it'll be different. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're not here to speculate <laughs> the downfall of society. Just kidding. Um, which I would have nothing to do with just that, but just in general society, I feel like is, is, uh, rapidly, rapidly changing, but you know where we stand on a lot of those issues. If you guys have tuned into the podcast before cough, cough, social media, <laughs> but let's get into the definition of like codependent. Like what does that actually sure. even mean okay. um, for people who maybe are unfamiliar with the term? So codependency is basically a dysfunctional relationship dynamic. Um, that exists where one person assumes the role more or less of the caregiver. Um, and what it, that in turn does is they sacrifice their needs, their own well-being emotionally, physically, for the sake of another person or the sake of the family. And so like it, it's basically like imagine somebody coming home and being exhausted and needing to take a break. But instead, I don't take a break because I have to focus on my husband or my wife's needs to, I have to make them dinner. I have to take care of things. Um, I have to make sure all the clothes are done. And so it can be, you can see how sometimes it can become very blurry, right? Where it's like, what are my normal duties as a spouse? Um, and as a member of this family to help support it versus when am I being kind of enabling and when am I sacrificing my own needs for the needs of other people? And so when it comes to that space in a healthy relationship, there's always a fair amount of giving and taking, right? You give, you receive, and that's a healthy relationship in any regard. And here's the other thing I want people to understand about codependency is that this relationship dynamic doesn't just have to exist in a romantic sense, in an intimate relationship. This is, this occurs between parent and child. This occurs between friends. This occurs between various family members. Um, and so just understanding how the dynamic and what the dynamic is and not necessarily looking at it in terms of, well, I can't be codependent because this is my significant other, or I can't be codependent because this is with my dad. Like, nope, you can be. It's a dynamic that exists independent of what the type of relationship is. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Do you find that people who are, you know, codependent in, let's say, a romantic relationship are mm-hmm. generally also that way in other relationships, or is it not really like a correlation that you see? Well, okay, so it's a mixed, it's a mixed bag. Um, I can see people and, and know people who are very codependent within their intimate relationship, but are not that way in every other aspect or every other relationship of their life. Um, and sometimes that may stem from an insecurity and anxiety. Um, you know, they might be more anxious about that particular attachment. Now, just because they're not that way in other relationships of their life doesn't necessarily mean that this didn't have its origins earlier in life. Um, and so it can be, you can see people who are codependent in almost every aspect of their life where their needs don't matter. And almost to the extent that their self-worth is defined by what they do for other people, their sense of love, their sense of purpose, their value that they bring into the relationship is not who I am. It's what I can do for all of you. Right. It's kind of like, well, there's mom. She's always, you know, she does everything for us. And it, that almost becomes the identity sometimes. Um, or there's my wife. Look at all the amazing things that she does for me. Right. And so it's kind of like, well, I got reward. I got attention. I get love. I get praise by being all of these things. And sometimes it can create why most people would come in for therapy is it's actually not that way. It start, they're starting to create um, very negative or unhealthy boundaries within themselves and they're feeling themselves exhausted and stressed out and worried all the time. And there's a lot of tension and frustration within the relationship. And I think that's the hard part with these kinds of conversations. Cause already, as you're saying this, I'm thinking like, you know, okay, well, someone has like these, like you just explained, someone comes home and they have these, these duties to do. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's like in certain relationships that could be the, uh, quote unquote agreement, a- right? A- like 100%. the agreement could be like, Hey, I do these things and then my partner does these things, mm-hmm. right? And then we have very clearly defined roles. But if you're only to hear like one part of it without hearing the other part, right? Like it can be challenging when you're just looking at someone's relationship because how many times do like friends or family members give like advice when mm-hmm. they don't really know the whole story, right? right. It's like, oh my gosh, well, he never does that or she never does this. And it's like, well, do you know what the other person does for, you know, mm-hmm. for us? 
And I think that, and that goes for, like you said, all relationships, right? Whether it's like family or friends too, everyone has different kind of boundaries and, and Mm -hmm. like agreements, but I would say probably like romantic relationships are probably the the biggest agreement because you're generally living with someone or Mm -hmm. working towards living with someone. Um, so like having those conversations about like, what does that actually look like? So it doesn't continue to get like, you know, broken down Mm -hmm. and only one person is kind of bearing all of the duties. Um, but like, to use like your point, sometimes that becomes like fulfilling for them, Mm -hmm. like up to a certain point. Yeah. Right. (laughs) So it's like hard to know because it's like, how do you like, when is too much, like too much, like it's so tough. And that's the, the goal is to find the balance between what is helping versus enabling. And what is the dynamic of the relationship that I'm in? And I don't mean the dy- and does again, this can be romantic. This can be within your family. Now, the history of codependency, and I think this is important to understand, and it, it might help conceptualize this for other people, is codependency is a term that was originally coined and started to use when we were dealing in substance abuse circles. Now, why substance abuse circles? Because su- the, the very nature of people who have and struggle with addiction or substance use is when you are in relationships with these people, it's very one-sided. Meaning the person who is the addict, um, everybody becomes very consumed and controlled by that person's behaviors and their addiction, right? So where codependency starts to develop, at least in children, is if I have a parent who's an addict, okay, a father who's an alcoholic, a mother who's a drug addict, whatever it might be, If you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the first one is food, water, shelter, right? And the second one is safety and security. And so what do we know about Maslow? It's like, well, you have to have each level completely fulfilled before you can ascend up. So if I don't feel safe and secure in my own house, meaning dad's going to be drunk, which means he might be angry, which means he might yell, he might scream, he might break things. It starts to create an embed and anxiety in me. And so what is that teaching me to do? It's like... I'm no longer paying attention to the things that are relevant to me as a developing child. I'm now starting to survey the room. What's dad's mood? And is dad in a good mood or a bad mood? So what are the things that I need to do to make sure dad doesn't stay in a bad mood? Or what are the things that I need to do to make myself invisible? Or mom's ranting and raving. And so before she gets home from work, I want to make sure I do these things to make sure she doesn't walk in the door and start attacking me verbally or physically or something. And children are oftentimes forced into the role of caregiver, meaning they start to do things that aren't like age appropriate for children. You know, children are tucking their parents into bed because mom passed out on the floor drunk. And so they're putting a blanket over them. They're caring for them. Now that means they're making lunches for themselves the next day to go to school. And so they're doing these tasks that aren't really age appropriate, but they have to do them because no one else is going to. So they end up assuming the role of caretaker for the parents and themselves. And so when you look at, like if you were to place two kids, like you have one house that's completely healthy and functioning the way that it should, and a house over here where there's addiction. Well, let's say you have like two 14-year-olds living in those houses. The kid who's in the house that's really healthy, he's not or she's not worrying about, hey, mom or dad are fighting again. They're like, oh, I've got a final coming up. And then the dance is around the corner and I want to get my prom dress or who am I going to ask to the prom, you know, or my car's in the shop and I want to go to work and I want to get this. So what are they doing? Their focus is in the future. Their focus is on themselves. They're not worrying about the safety of the environment. And so they're able to develop in this space that kind of keeps them growing and developing. You go to the other house where the kid is dealing with an alcoholic or a drug addict person. Well, they're not thinking about prom. They're not thinking about the test. They're like... I don't want to get hit tonight or I don't want to be yelled at, right? And so they're worrying about maintaining the environment that they live in. And so their focus is in here. It's in these, it's in this room, these four walls. It's not about my future, not about what I'm thinking. So they, they develop in a space where it's for their safety. They have to worry about monitoring everybody else's feelings and addressing and attending to them so that their environment is as safe as possible and can soothe that anxiety. And sometimes they never ascend to that third period, which is love and belonging. Because how do I ever really belong or feel loved if I'm always worrying about other people? So you can see why if this develops now, why it is very easy for that person to be in a relationship with somebody who's going to be much more selfish. It's so tough because when you're in 
you know, say someone comes into your office, you know, I come into your office, I'm 32 and I'm like, I don't know where this is all coming from. Right. And like, mm-hmm. let's say I had a childhood like that. Like that's so hard to rewire all of those things from the time that you were like 10, right? Like that's like 20 years of wiring or however old someone might've been, but that's why it's so like, you probably don't even really recognize it. Right. And like you said, a lot of people just come in and they're like, I'm just overwhelmed. I'm maxed out. I don't really know why I'm feeling this way. So what are some of the other signs and symptoms that maybe someone could be before maybe they understand what this is, or they're just kind of experiencing this that would point to like, Hey, you're in a codependent relationship. Okay. Well, are you putting aside the things that are important for you to take care of other people? Um, are you doing things for other people that they could be doing for themselves and have the capability of doing for themselves, but aren't, um, is your identity and sense of self more consumed with how other people are feeling and thinking than what your goals and ambitions might be for yourself? Are your goals, other people's goals, right? And so now again, it's a balancing act. It's understanding like what's the difference between being supportive of my spouse or my significant other who's pursuing this change in career or new goal versus are my goals all about this other person, right? And so it can become exhausting to the individual who's in that relationship trying to decipher between what's helpful and what's enabling. Yeah, that's because like you said, like sometimes it's not even that they're necessarily bad things that they're just like taken to this extreme level Mm -hmm. um so i guess what would be like the enabling aspect or like where where does that part come in okay well the enabling aspect is okay so here's another thing am i attempting to rescue this person Mm. right and so we're going to get into i guess we could skip to it there's a thing that's called that i a lot of people get familiar with who struggle with codependency it's called the cartman trauma triangle okay Okay, now what the triangle represents is literally a a triangle and there's three points to that triangle which is victim persecutor and rescuer okay and so what you end up seeing is the person who is the rescuer is more or less the person who's struggling with codependency and oftentimes what they have found are people in their lives that they perceive as the victim of things, victim of circumstance, victim of life opportunities, victim of challenges and all these other things. And so the people who are natural kind of caregivers, or if you've ever been told you're a people pleaser, sometimes those can be cues that you might be struggling or have some issues with codependency, but it's the need to identify like, well, this person needs my help. And I view them as needing my help, not because they asked for it necessarily, but because I perceive this person to be the victim. And it's easy for me as a self-rescuer to go in and do all these things for this person so that they don't have to do them themselves or learn how to do them themselves. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. What was the other part? Victim? The persecutor. Persecutor. Okay. And then how does that all, Well, I guess, (laughs) close the loop? (laughs) Here's how this, here's here's how the, the loop can work in unhealthy relationships is that if I'm the rescuer and you're the victim mm-hmm. and I go to show up and rescue you mm-hmm. and you get angry with me because the one time I don't show up to rescue, you then shift from rescuer to persecutor because now you're attacking me for not saving you, for not being the person I wanted you to be. And so I get very angry. And so the idea is, is we can bounce back and forth because now I moved from the rescuer to the victim of the relationship because I didn't fulfill your needs or I wasn't there for you enough. And so we can kind of bounce back and forth between this. And you'll see this dynamic play out in unhealthy relationships, period. People with personality disorders, people without personality disorders. Um, This is a very common dynamic that occurs with people who have like borderline personality. Um, And so you just want to be aware of like, am I assuming the role of the victim? Am I, am am I attempting to rescue this person? You know, if I find myself on that triangle, I need to get off the triangle. And there's another triangle called the empowerment triangle that is like the opposite of those, which help people (laughs) understand the boundaries that go with them. Okay. And what's that look like? Okay. I'm like, I gotta know. You can't, you can't say that and then (laughs) not tell me. (laughs) So instead of, instead of persecutor, we Mm -hmm. have the challenger. Okay. Instead of the rescuer, we have the coach. Okay. You should be pretty familiar with that role. <laughs> um, and instead of the victim, we have the creator. So let's look okay. at this. So the persecutor, um, 
thinks that they must win all the time, controls others or aspects of self through blame, criticism, and kind of oppression, so to speak. Whereas the challenger is somebody who um, learns by challenging assumptions and naming facts and focuses on development and holding people accountable, right? Their partner accountable for themselves. The coach versus rescuer is kind of like, well, the rescuer is a person who um, saves people from themselves, right? Um, they create temporarily, or excuse me, I can't talk right now, temporary short-term relief. Mm -hmm. So I step in and do something for you that I know you're completely capable of doing for yourself. You just didn't do it. And so I'm going to do it for you because that's me being the rescuer. I'm going to do the things for you that you can do, but you aren't doing. Um, and this kind of creates a dependency where you start to learn to depend on me in ways that you didn't have to depend on anybody before. And that fulfills my needs and makes me feel loved in the relationship, perhaps even. And now I feel more secure. Whereas the coach is somebody who kind of empowers people to help them gain the level of clarity and to learn to do the things on their own that they don't need other people to do for them. Yeah. And the victim is the person who is moved from this kind of powerless position. That's traditionally what the victim is. Of these circumstances, they're unwilling to take responsibility for their life and, and those kinds of things. And the creator um, focuses on a vision of what the desired outcomes could be, right? Um, it, they help them take full responsibility for um, the actions that can lead to the outcomes they're looking for. Mm -hmm. rather than doing those things for them. Yeah, I like that a lot. And it, I think it shows that there's a lot there. I don't want to say there's a lot of similarities, but it's basically like where like the fork in the road of like, mm -hmm. this is like a similar like antidote. And then it's like, okay, this is like the positive aspect of it. And then right. like, oh, this is the sharp turn <laughs> to the left. That's pretty negative. <laughs> like you maybe had good intentions, but here's like it going awry. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, I like I like that a lot. I'm like I want to see I want to see this graph. I'm like show me the graph <laughs> after. <laughs> I'll show you the graph. <laughs> I'm trying to draw it in my mind. <laughs> I'm like, okay, here it is. Here's this. <laughs> well, yeah, it's like it's a triangle here and then a triangle yeah. on the bottom, right? And so there's just flip it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I gotta like visualize everything. Um, but I think I guess this is so tough because it's like I guess just for me, understanding it is tough because there are so many positive aspects to it. But then it's like where does it take that turn? Mm -hmm. Right. Like, I mean, obviously some of it is, is, is pretty negative, but like, it seems like a lot of it starts out with like positive intentions. Like, Hey, you know what? Like, let me just do this for someone because like maybe they, they would probably appreciate it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but then like, does that get like taken out of context and like, like, right. Like where does this start to maybe disintegrate or where does this start to, to change negatively or does, or is it always just kind of starting out from like a negative place? that make sense well i wouldn't say that it starts out from a negative place necessarily because it's stemming for some people out of a space of survival mm -hmm. right and so they're learning to survive which we have to do and they're not necessarily like looking to attach themselves to that but if you're a developing child and you grow up in an environment mm -hmm. where there's people who kind of abuse that in you then it's very easy for that to become a lifelong pattern right because that's, that's all you know and in fact that's sometimes how you receive love from those people and how you perceive love is within my ability to take care of somebody. And that's what, what makes it so hard to break. What happens if you have a very codependent person who suddenly finds themselves attracted to somebody new who's very dependent or, or excuse me, independent and doesn't need them to do a lot of things. Well, they can feel very anxious in that relationship because it's like, I'm used to being able to take care of this person and now they're not asking me to do anything. Well, who am I then? That's a really big question. And it's kind of like, oh, wow, I don't know who I am. And so sometimes they back out of the relationship to find somebody that they can take care of. Mm -hmm. You know, and codependency is also a thing that happens, obviously, where you have parents who have a child who's an addict. And so the parents don't want the children to feel the full weight of those consequences of the kid. Like the kid can't hold a job. They're not paying rent anymore. Right. So what do you see the parents doing? Well, the kid's going to be homeless. So I'm, I'm going to pay his rent for him. You know, I'm going to give him a place to stay so that they don't end up on the streets. And so parents and family members are oftentimes the last ones to let go 
and to put healthy boundaries up around people who are struggling with codependency because they themselves don't want the bad thing to happen to their own kid. And so That's can, understandable. It's yeah. like, oh my gosh, it'd be like the hardest thing. Mm-hmm. I couldn't imagine as a parent doing that, yeah. you know? Um, but, you know, at some point that does become enabling, right? Like that would, you yeah. would say that that could, that could be enabling mm-hmm. someone's, um, you know, current circumstances. And that's where it's tough to know. Cause you're like, no, they, they, they want to get better this time. But then it's like, that's like that whole loop of addiction, which is a whole different, um, yeah, discussion. And so but for people who are struggling with codependency, one of the first things to do is to start to ask yourself and start to define the difference between what are enabling behaviors and what are, supportive behaviors. Number one, I will tell people to pay attention to how you feel after you help this person. Do you feel like you just got used? You know, do you feel shame or guilt for doing it? Um, So paying attention to how you feel, like when you're genuinely helping out a friend, like somebody's like, hey, can you come help me move? Like, oh, they don't really ask for much of me. And you show up, you help them move. And you're like, you go about your day. You don't even think twice about it. You know, but it's kind of like, oh, so and so is calling me again to help them with this, with their computer, with a move, with something. Like you see that reaction that comes up just by talking about that person or mm-hmm. thinking about that person. And we all have those people who are very needy in our mm-hmm. lives. And it's like, are they needy? Is this a, a slightly codependent relationship in that they're relying on me to do too many things for them that they could be doing themselves? Um, so that generally starts to happen. Ask yourself, are you doing things for them that they're capable of doing for themselves? Um, And if it's age appropriate and they know how to do it, right? Like I'm not going to go ask my eight-year-old to go pay the bills. Um, But I would ask like a 21-year-old to go pay the bills. Um, He probably could, let's be honest. (laughs) He might, actually. He he probably could. He probably could. He'd probably enjoy it too. He's a weirdo. Um, Do they know how to do things, but they just are choosing not to do them? Um. And then to kind of dive a little bit deeper into enabling behaviors, is it, are you trying to change or manipulate an unfavorable situation? Are you trying to regain control by doing things for other people? Are you trying to increase stability by doing things? Because now you're trying to solve or soothe anxiety. Um, Are your efforts designed to protect these loved ones? Meaning like, are you paying their outstanding debts so that they don't have to be accountable for them? Um, are you blaming other people for when they kind of challenge your beliefs? What I mean by that, um, blaming other people for your loved one's challenges, like little Mikey is struggling the way that he is because he didn't have his mom and dad in his life. And so I'm doing these things for him. (sighs) Okay. Like, is that really why is Mikey struggling? Probably. But are you using the absence of his parents as a way to make you feel better and validated within the relationship by now assuming the role almost of mom and dad? You're going to love him the way his parents never loved him. And so you found this person that you can love and nurture and care for in a very motherly kind of a way, but you're doing things that don't allow this person to progress in a healthy way. And so you're going to make excuses for the current status that they're in based off of these other things. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I, it just continues to highlight like how delicate this is in my mm-hmm. mind, at least maybe I'm it's just how I'm viewing it because so many of the things are, and I, I keep using the, like the terms like positive and negative, which I know is not the right like words, but like sometimes it's like, yeah, you know what? Like that person could do that, but they're really stressed out or busy right now. Like it would make, it would be good to like help them and do this. Right. Which mm-hmm. is not like a bad thing. No. But then it's like, if it's if it's every single time right like that's where i guess it's so like the line is so delicate of like where is this behavior turning into codependency versus just like hey i want to help you out Mm -hmm. right like if someone if somebody had the ability to like if someone is in like serious debt and like their family member could help them like and not take away from their Mm -hmm. life and you know hold it over them and have all these crazy things happening like right just like genuinely be like hey i want to help you out like I don't know if I look at that as like a bad thing, but then it's like, if it's like this continuous behavior, right. And then it's like, mm-hmm. it's just like, it's such like a, a delicate line. Um, and then like, you don't always know, especially when you're the other person who's in maybe the less great situation. You're yeah. like oh, anyone to help me. That would be great. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you're like, you're not thinking like 
is this person like doing this to like mm-hmm. be, you know, to maybe like hold this over me now or to do this or that? And I don't know, I guess it's just like such a tough and delicate thing. It is. But if you listened to even the way you were describing that, mm-hmm. how did I feel at the beginning of the relationship when I started helping this person? And I mm-hmm. probably felt really good. Yeah. But now every time so-and-so calls me up, I'm starting to feel this reaction about mm-hmm. them. Well, maybe this is me that I need to take a step back and, and kind of check this relationship within myself and be like, maybe I'm doing too much. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, so maybe it's been years that this has been happening and it was a slow erosion. Like mm-hmm. that's, that's normal. Like don't beat yourself up over it. If this is, if you're listening to this and going like, yeah, that's me or I'm doing this, like it's okay. And the other part of this is it, why this is so important is I, I made a note of this and this is, this tells you how rooted, um, this stuff is in us is that human beings are wired for emotional bonds, right? We've talked about attachment versus um, authenticity, right? And so these bonds are so important to us that we don't reject the relationship at the first sign of, you know, at the onset of like problematic behaviors. You're not just like, everything has been great. And now there's one problem. Oh, bye. See ya. I'm done with the relationship. Mom, <laughs> dad, brother, sister, whoever, Right. I'm putting up my boundary. Don't ever speak to me again. (laughs) And in some ways, these people who you might have a codependent relationship with, these aren't people you're going to kick out of your life forever. They're just people that we need stronger boundaries with. Yeah. Right? (laughs) And so it's it's being comfortable with saying no. It's being comfortable with saying yes, like which can be even more difficult when a person's like, I know I'm totally codependent. I'm a people pleaser. I do everything. And you're like, oh, okay. Well, how do I know when it's okay to say yes again? It's sometimes it's easy for the person to be like, no, no, no. Oh, I'm really good at saying no now. Because <laughs> I then, know to everything. <laughs> they, exactly. <laughs> but then they don't know how to say yes when yes feels healthy. And so it's like, it's okay if you make a mistake, if you regress in some of this, like it's normal. But we're talking about the relationships that are so fundamental to your survival. It's so mm-hmm. deeply rooted in us that it's not an easy solution for it. No, this sounds like, I know we talk about a lot of different topics on here and obviously on, on the podcast, we try to provide a lot of context and a lot mm-hmm. of, you know, nuance, but I truly feel like this is one that really does need some like one-on-one work. Like, like I don't feel like there's a lot of general stuff there here. There could be groups with this. Yeah. Like I don't. Al-Anon yeah. is one. Al-Anon? Mm-hmm. Okay. Al-Anon. Like it's kind of, it's like AA for people with codependency. Oh, oh wow. That's yeah. good. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just think that this is one of those things that is going to need a lot of like actual work with a therapist or a group, right? Mm-hmm. And not just like, hey, I read about this a little bit. Like I saw some, you know, I saw the triangles, mm-hmm. like I saw some posts. <laughs> now I figured it out. Like this to me feels like it really needs a lot of um, individualized um, treatment. It can right? because you can dissect the relationships that are specific to you rather mm-hmm. than looking at them in generalities. Yeah, because there's so many things that we talk about that like, okay, yeah. like like anxiety, Right. Like, of course, that's specific to each individual, but it's like a lot of things, like 80% of things could probably help most people who are anxious. Mm-hmm. Right. I feel like with this, it's so like specific to mm-hmm. like the the people and the situations and like the dynamics. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's so many different types of dynamics that this could affect that it's like, I feel like this, at least from my understanding, would mm-hmm. really require, you know, digging in with a therapist or like you said, even a group, because some people get a lot out of group settings in that Mm way um and you know especially hearing maybe other stories because sometimes i could imagine with this stuff you're kind of like well i don't know if it's that bad or or you know and but maybe having the other people around you it could like help reflect Mm -hmm. like oh okay now i can see myself in them and their stories a little bit easier um which i think could probably help because oftentimes we view things of course through our perception Mm -hmm. and we think oh okay well that's not that bad or like i'm doing a good thing (laughs) you know in this situation and then we're like oh wait let me but then, you know, if you go to like somewhere like social media, you know, mm-hmm. a few bullet points on a post and like, if you do this, you're a co- it's like, yeah, yeah. that's the kind of stuff where it's like, I feel like it would be a lot harder to make these like generalized statements mm-hmm. useful. Right. Yeah. Um, and what was the book that you mentioned again in the beginning? It was called Codependent No More by Melody Beattie. Okay. So definitely recommend it's a that. Mo- it's a great read only because even if you don't feel like you struggle with codependency, it's a really, really well-written book. She does an excellent job in the book. She talks about boundaries and being able to detach from certain people um, with love, detaching with love, detaching without love. Um, she co- covers the Cartman trauma triangle. And you, she really does a great job of kind of unpacking what are unhealthy behaviors. 
And so one of the caveats that I'll tell people to reading this book sometimes is I'm like, yes, we've been talking a lot about like substance use as it relates to codependency. But what I tell people is when I, because sometimes I'll, I'll listen to them and the dynamics of their family, they might not have an addict, but they might have a really just selfish parent mm-hmm. or a parent who didn't do a really great job of being nurturing and supportive. And so I'll tell people, do me a favor, read the book. And whenever they're referencing substance abuse, just replace substance abuse with unhealthy behavior. And so it's like, oh, my so-and-so was an addict. So-and-so was an unhealthy person. Because it's not like beer, wine, booze. That's not the issue. The issue is the way the person acts in the relationship that creates these dynamics. And so it's like you can have a very selfish, toxic, unhealthy parent who's not an addict at all. But these dynamics get created in them. And so it's like, this to me is like, as I would use it more or less today, like, yes, definitely. If you grew up with an alcoholic parent or an alcoholic sibling, because this is the other thing, right? You ever, if you're, you listen to people who have like two or three siblings and if their brother or sister was the one who was the addict, who do you think got the majority of attention in the family? Right. And you could be getting straight A's and you could be doing everything right. But you know what? You're not the one causing problems. It's kind of like right now. If your kitchen's on fire, right, we're not going to worry about the rest of the house. What are we going to do? We're going to put the fire out in the kitchen. Why? Because that's the part that demands our our attention right now. So everybody else in the room can be doing everything that they need to do, but Mm -hmm. all of the attention is going to this one person who just kind of is like this vacuum for energy and love. And it's like, well, well, what about me? And so the other person has to start doing things to kind of catch up. Yeah. Yeah. This is like such an insidious thing and i i honestly just as you're talking about this i feel like there's just so many ways that this could play out in in life just on different varying degrees you know it doesn't have to be like oh my gosh you're the most codependent person ever or what Mm -hmm. like it could just be like these small amounts um so i definitely want to check the book out as well just to to read um any other thoughts on on this that would be helpful to kind of let me just wrap up like what is supportive behavior yes right so we covered what's enabling what is supportive look like um supportive is that I don't feel bad after helping. Um, supportive oftentimes is that I'm not doing it for them. I'm teaching them. I'm guiding them along the way. Coaching. Like for example, coaching. See, now you're picking it up, right? <laughs> you're not rescuing, you're coaching. Um, Yay. <laughs> but if I were to, you know, we'll, we'll save that later. Um, but like, here's an example of what that might look like. We were talking about online bill pay. Like, mm-hmm. so my son decides that at some point he has a bank account and he needs to pay his bills. Well, and he's like, dad, I don't, I don't want to write checks. I don't even think he'll know what checks are for years of his life. <laughs> but I might be like, okay, well, there's a lot of different ways that a person can do online bill pay. People can set it up so that it automatically debits right out of their account. People can set it up where they log their accounts in their bank and they can pay right out of their bank. Some people like to go to individual websites to make sure that the creditor has that information, whatever. So I might sit my son down and be like, okay, here's how I do it. Like, this is how you pay the mortgage. And so I show him like, you go to the mortgage website or you go to your bank, you put the information in, great. Here, now you do this with your power and electric bill. Okay, and he does it with the power and electric bill. Well, maybe a month or two from now, he's like, hey dad, I'm filling out a loan application and I don't know what to put for this. Okay, here, let me help you. And I'm gonna do this with him. Why? Because I know he's gonna fill out loan applications for the rest of his life but you want to teach and guide and you might have questions. And so he's going to come back, but I'm not doing it for him. I'm not like, here, son, give me all your bills. I'm going to set up your online bill pay and do it for him. I'm going to teach him to give him the skills, but I'm going to guide him along the way. Mm -hmm. Um, Supportive behavior oftentimes looks like listening, right? I don't have to do things for you. I can just listen to you. And in many ways, here's a great little kind of role reversal. If you're the type of person who's listening to somebody and for the men out there, listen to this too because men and women interpret problems very differently women are much more relational with it but men want to solve problems so you'll hear a woman a lot of times be like i was talking about this problem that i had at work and all he told me to do was how to solve it right and so they they get pissed off and then he's pissed off because he's like i told him the perfect yeah. way to solve the problem Why is she so all angry? i was thinking about was right? just like this dynamic <laughs> Instead, you tell them, like, if you're just listening, you have to, like, resist the urge to solve the problem and then ask a question back and just be like, wow, that sounds really hard. So tell me, how are you going to solve this? And now it goes back on them. And if they're like, I don't know. What she didn't say was, I don't know. What would you do? 
And if you didn't ask for my opinion, shut up. Don't give it to them. Just sit there and be like, that sounds difficult. What are you going to do? I don't know yet. I'm going to figure it out. Okay, cool. Well, good luck with that. And guess what ends up happening? You don't feel frustrated later when she doesn't acknowledge your contribution and she doesn't feel misunderstood or that you didn't listen to her because, and I don't mean to use just the typical roles of male, female there, but. Oh, but that's a, that's a pretty common one. It's a, it's a pretty <laughs> it's common so scenario common. that yeah. does play out. And it's like, just don't offer the unsolicited advice. Um, and that goes with friendships too. Mm-hmm. You know, it's something, especially like people who, you know, a lot of times if people are, are sharing things or, and then you're like, oh my gosh, I've gone through this exact scenario. Like I want to share how to help and I want to do, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. And again, it's coming from like a good place, but it's one of those things where you have to be like, okay, did they ask or are they just talking, mm-hmm. right? Do I, do I just need to like listen? Yeah. Um, and, or even say, Hey, like, you know, like you said, what do you want to, or even, you know, you can bring up different ways to like prompt and you can see if someone does want you to okay. say something, you know, cause some people don't know how to ask mm-hmm. either, right? Like some people don't know how to ask like for help. Right. Um, and then they kind of wish like, Oh, I wish they would have said something, you know, because mm-hmm. like, you know, you'll hear that too. Like, well, nobody ever like tries to help me. And it's like, well, you never asked. Right. So there's like that, that too. Um, but yeah. Oh my gosh. The listening thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen. Is, is so huge. <laughs> um, you could be a resource for people. Um, most importantly, avoid solving their problems, right? Like, I think you've done this. I've asked you before, like, how come you don't just tell people what to eat? And you're mm-hmm. like, I don't tell people what to eat because they need to learn how to do it without me there. Mm-hmm. Like, they can't call you every time they're at a restaurant and be like, hey, Lauren, what, what am I supposed to eat that falls in line with my macro diet? Like, mm-hmm. no. That's creating a codependent client. Exactly. You're going <laughs> to you create a scenario where they're like, these are healthy foods. These are yeah. what you should eat. This is what you should look for. Yeah. Um, and it's also not. To your point, not doing now it all makes sense. Okay, now I'm like, oh, of course. Um, now you're not rescuing them. Yeah, because I I always tell people too when we're going through something that's new, I'm mm-hmm. like, you are probably going to mess this up, right? And that's okay. I'm not going to be able to do this for you. I can't save you from this. You can't save yourself from this. You just have to go through it. Like we can, you know, I can coach you through kind of what would be a good idea, um, good plan. You know, have a course of action. But then ultimately, like, you're going to have to, like, jump off and do it and try it. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to have to come back and see where did this go wrong. And then yeah. we can make adjustments. But there's no way to, like, have a perfect plan without having some failures in there or exactly. some mess ups. Yeah. And oftentimes when people are trying to work through their relationship with food, that's one of the biggest things. It's like they're scared to try things because mm-hmm. they've messed up so many times. And that's understandable. Yeah. But it's like if, you know, if you were to call your coach every time you were presented with a challenge... That is literally creating a codependent relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, and the same thing when people are like, oh, well, just, you know, I wish I could just like, you know, text someone every day that I, no, mm-hmm. that's a codependent relationship. You need to be able to foster these skills on your own. You right. know what I mean? Um, doesn't mean that someone should ignore you. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't mean your coach or your trainer should ignore you, but there's a level of, of that. And honestly, that happens entirely too much in our space sadly and then that's how people keep clients for forever Mm -hmm. in a not healthy way you Mm -hmm. know in in this like codependent way because the client then doesn't think they can do anything on their own without the coach and it's like that's just not true like you're the one who's doing all these things so yeah Yeah. we see this a lot in our space i just i'll bet it's yeah i'll bet it's just it's just different in terms of dynamics but yeah Hopefully this is a pretty good overview of what codependency is and how to look for it. Um, And remind yourself too, one thing that I would like to say is sometimes certain situations in a person's life, they might need to be a little bit more selfish, right? Like a perfect example, I'm going to use you for an example, like you're starting a graduate program soon. Your life is going to dramatically change, right? (laughs) Well, the idea would be you might not have as much free time. You might not have the ability to do certain things. So it could be very easy for people who are in your life to step up and be like, oh, I'm going to help Lauren with this or I'm going to do this, right? Well, why? Because you're, the dynamic of your life has shifted. So the people in your life might be more inclined to step up and help you with things, but eventually that's going to return. Well, is it a codependent relationship to be like, I'm going to help Lauren because now she doesn't have as much time to do certain things? No, that's helping. Is it that Lauren is now expecting me to do all of these things? Now we're starting to get into this space of like victim, persecutor, rescuer kind of thing. And I want to get off of that and be like more I want to help. But sometimes life circumstances and changes can 
alter the dynamic of the relationship to the point where it's like, it is up to me to be a little bit more selfless right now to help this person because they're doing Mm -hmm. these things and they're trying to better themselves. But eventually that's going to balance back out. And you understand that it's about this particular reason, not because I'm trying to fulfill the need in me to be wanted or desired or to control Mm -hmm. versus to be helpful. Absolutely. And that just goes back to like what you're saying with like the intention and how mm-hmm. do you feel around it? Yeah. Um, and really just continuously checking back in kind of with that. So um, I love this podcast. I really think it was super useful. And I know a lot of people probably will get a lot of benefit out of listening to this, reading that book. And then if they do feel like they're falling into these types of behaviors or have dealt with them in the past, you know, working with someone could be mm-hmm. really, really important through this. So if people are interested in reaching out to you for consulting, what would be the best email address? Uh, full circle therapy, FL at gmail.com. And for all other information about our coaching services, you can visit redefinehealthybrands.com. Send us an email there. Um, there's also an anonymous link in the show notes. So you can fill out if you have any questions, uh, specific questions or topics you would like us to address on the show. Thank you guys so much for listening and we'll talk to you next week.